Chapter 23 The Clinton Presidency The eight-year presidential term of Bill Clinton, a personable, articulate graduate of Yale Law School, a Rhodes Scholar, and former governor of Arkansas, began with a hope that a bright young person would bring to the country what he promised, change. But Clinton's presidency ended with no chance that it would, as he had wished, make his mark in history as one of the nation's great presidents. His last year in office was marked by sensational scandals surrounding his personal life. More important, he left no legacy of bold innovation in domestic policy or departure from traditional nationalist foreign policy. At home, he surrendered again and again to caution and conservatism, signing legislation that was more pleasing to the Republican Party and big business than to those Democrats who still recalled the bold programs of Franklin Roosevelt. Abroad, there were futile shows of military braggadocio and a subservience to what President Dwight Eisenhower had once warned against, the military-industrial complex. Clinton had barely won election both times, in 1992, with 45% of the voting population staying away from the polls, he only received 43% of the votes, the senior Bush getting 38%, while 19% of the voters showed their distaste for both parties by voting for a third-party candidate, Ross Perot. In 1996, with half the population not voting, Clinton won 49% of the votes against the lackluster Republican candidate, Robert Dole. There was a distinct absence of voter enthusiasm. One bumper sticker read, If God had intended us to vote, he would have given us candidates. At his second inauguration ceremony, Clinton spoke of the nation at the edge of a new century in a new millennium. He said, We need a new government for a new century. But Clinton's rhetoric was not matched by his performance. It happened that the inauguration coincided with the nationwide celebration of the birthday of Martin Luther King Jr., and Clinton invoked King's name several times in his address. The two men, however, represented very different social philosophies. By the time King was assassinated in 1968, he had come to believe that our economic system was fundamentally unjust and needed radical transformation. He spoke of the evils of capitalism and asked for a radical redistribution of economic and political power. On the other hand, as major corporations gave money to the Democratic Party on an unprecedented scale, Clinton demonstrated clearly his total confidence in the market system and private enterprise. During his 1992 campaign, the chief executive officer of Martin Marietta Corporation, which held huge and lucrative government contracts for military production, noted, I think the Democrats are moving more toward business, and business is moving more toward the Democrats. Martin Luther King's reaction to the buildup of military power had been the same as his reaction to the Vietnam War. This madness must cease. And the evils of racism, economic exploitation, and militarism are all tied together. Clinton was willing to recall King's dream of racial equality, but not his dream of a society rejecting violence. Even though the Soviet Union was no longer a military threat, he insisted that the United States must keep its armed forces dispersed around the globe, prepare for two regional wars, and maintain the military budget at Cold War levels. Despite his lofty rhetoric, Clinton showed in his eight years in office that he, like other politicians, was more interested in electoral victory than in social change. To get more votes, he decided he must move the party closer to the center. This meant doing just enough for blacks, women, and working people to keep their support, while trying to win over white conservative voters with a program of toughness on crime, stern measures on welfare, and a strong military. Clinton in office followed this plan quite scrupulously. He made a few cabinet appointments that suggested support for labor and for social welfare programs, and appointed a black pro-labor man as head of the National Labor Relations Board. But his key appointments to the Treasury and Commerce Departments were wealthy corporate lawyers, and his foreign policy staff, the Secretary of Defense, the Director of the CIA, the National Security Advisor, were traditional players on the bipartisan Cold War team. Clinton appointed more people of color to government posts than his Republican predecessors. But if any prospective or actual appointees became too bold, Clinton abandoned them quickly.
His Secretary of Commerce, Ronald Brown, who was killed in a plane crash, was black and a corporate lawyer, and Clinton was clearly pleased with him. On the other hand, Lanny Guineer, a black legal scholar who was being considered for a job with the Civil Rights Division of the Justice Department, was abandoned when conservatives objected to her strong ideas on matters of racial equality and voter representation. And when Surgeon General Jocelyn Elders, a black, made the controversial suggestion that masturbation was a proper subject in sex education, Clinton asked her to resign. This was especially ironic considering Clinton's later sexual adventures in the White House. He showed the same timidity in the two appointments he made to the Supreme Court, making sure that Ruth Bader Ginsburg and Stephen Breyer would be moderate enough to be acceptable to Republicans as well as to Democrats. He was not willing to fight for a strong liberal to follow in the footsteps of Thurgood Marshall or William Brennan, who had recently left the court. Breyer and Ginsburg both defended the constitutionality of capital punishment and upheld drastic restrictions on the use of habeas corpus. Both voted with the most conservative judges on the court to uphold the constitutional right of Boston St. Patrick's Day Parade organizers to exclude gay marchers. In choosing judges for the lower federal courts, Clinton showed himself no more likely to appoint liberals than the Republican Gerald Ford had in the 70s. According to a three-year study published in the Fordham Law Review in early 1996, Clinton's appointments made liberal decisions in less than half their cases. The New York Times noted that while Reagan and Bush had been willing to fight for judges who would reflect their philosophies, Mr. Clinton, in contrast, has been quick to drop judicial candidates if there is even a hint of controversy. Clinton was eager to show he was tough on matters of law and order. Running for president in 1992, while still governor of Arkansas, he flew back to Arkansas to oversee the execution of a mentally retarded man on death row. And early in his administration, in April 1993, he and Attorney General Janet Reno approved an FBI attack on a group of religious zealots who were armed and ensconced in a building complex in Waco, Texas. Instead of waiting for negotiations to bring about a solution, the FBI attacked with rifle fire, tanks, and gas, resulting in a fire that swept through the compound, killing at least 86 men, women, and children. One of the few survivors of the Waco tragedy was David Thibodeau, who in his book, A Place Called Waco, gives us a rare inside description of the human consequences of the government attack. Despite the fact that more than 30 women and children were crowded into the narrow concrete chamber at the base of the residential tower, the tank crashed into the ceiling, shoving chunks of broken concrete onto the people huddled below. Six women and kids were immediately crushed by falling blocks. The rest were suffocated by the dust and gas vapors as the tank injected massive doses of CS directly into their windowless, unventilated shelter. The charred corpse of six-year-old star, David's oldest daughter, David Koresh, who was the leader of the religious sect, was found with her spine bent into a backward bow until her head almost touched her feet. Her muscles were contracted by the combined effect of the fire's heat and the cyanide in her body, a byproduct of CS gas suffocation. Clinton and Reno gave feeble excuses for what clearly was a reckless decision to launch a military attack on a group of men, women, and children. Reno at one time talked of children being molested, which was totally unsubstantiated, and even if true, could hardly justify the massacre that took place. As so often happens in cases where the government commits murder, the surviving victims were put on trial, with the judge overruling the request of the jury not to levy harsh sentences and ruling for imprisonment up to 40 years. Professor James Fife of Temple University, who taught criminal justice, said, there is no FBI to investigate the FBI. There is no Justice Department to investigate the Justice Department. One of the people sentenced by the judge was Rinos Avram, who commented, This nation is supposed to run under laws, not personal feelings. When you ignore the law, you sow the seeds of terrorism. This turned out to be a prophetic statement. Timothy McVeigh, who some years after the Waco tragedy was convicted of bombing the federal building in Oklahoma City, which cost 168 lives, had visited the Waco site twice. Later, according to an FBI affidavit, McVeigh was extremely agitated about the government's assault on Waco. Clinton's law and order approach led him early in his first term to sign legislation 
cutting funds for state resource centers that supplied lawyers to indigent prisoners. The result, according to Bob Herbert, writing in the New York Times, was that a man facing the death penalty in Georgia had to appear at a habeas corpus proceeding without a lawyer. In 1996, the president signed legislation that made it more difficult for judges to put prison systems under special masters to ensure the improvement of terrible prison conditions. He also approved a new statute withholding federal funds for legal services where lawyers use those funds to handle class action suits. Such suits were important for challenging assaults on civil liberties. The Crime Bill of 1996, which both Republicans and Democrats in Congress voted for overwhelmingly, and which Clinton endorsed with enthusiasm, dealt with the problem of crime by emphasizing punishment, not prevention. It extended the death penalty to a whole range of criminal offenses and provided $8 billion for the building of new prisons. All this was to persuade voters that politicians were tough on crime, but, as criminologist Todd Clear wrote in the New York Times, Tougher is Dumber, about the new crime bill, harsher sentencing had added one million people to the prison population, giving the United States the highest rate of incarceration in the world, and yet violent crime continued to increase. Why, Clear asked, do harsh penalties seem to have so little to do with crime? A crucial reason is that Police and prisons have virtually no effect on the sources of criminal behavior. He pointed to those sources. About 70% of prisoners in New York State come from eight neighborhoods in New York City. These neighborhoods suffer profound poverty, exclusion, marginalization, and despair. All these things nourish crime. Those holding political power, whether Clinton or his Republican predecessors, had something in common. They sought to keep their power by diverting the anger of citizens to groups without the resources to defend themselves. As H. L. Mencken, the acerbic social critic of the 1920s, put it, the whole aim of practical politics is to keep the populace alarmed by menacing it with an endless series of hobgoblins, all of them imaginary. Criminals were among these hobgoblins, also immigrants, people on welfare, and certain governments, Iraq, North Korea, Cuba. By turning attention to them, by inventing or exaggerating their dangers, the failures of the American system could be concealed. Immigrants were a convenient object of attack, because as non-voters their interests could be safely ignored. It was easy for politicians to play upon the xenophobia that has erupted from time to time in American history, the anti-Irish prejudices of the mid-19th century, the continual violence against Chinese who had been brought in to work on the railroads, the hostility toward immigrants from Eastern and Southern Europe that led to the restrictive immigration laws of the 1920s. The reform spirit of the 60s had led to an easing of restrictions on immigration, but in the 90s, Democrats and Republicans alike played on the economic fears of working Americans. Jobs were being lost because corporations were firing employees to save money, downsizing, or moving plants out of the country to more profitable situations. Immigrants, especially the large numbers coming over the southern border from Mexico, were blamed for taking jobs from citizens of the United States, for receiving government benefits, for causing higher taxes on American citizens. Both major political parties joined to pass legislation, which Clinton then signed, to remove welfare benefits, food stamps, payments to elderly and disabled people, from not only illegal but legal immigrants. By early 1997, letters were going out to close to a million legal immigrants who were poor, old, or disabled, warning them that their food stamps and cash payments would be cut off in a few months unless they became citizens. For perhaps half a million legal immigrants, passing the tests required for becoming a citizen was quite impossible. They could not read English, were sick or disabled, or were just too old to learn. An immigrant from Portugal living in Massachusetts told a reporter through an interpreter, Every day we are afraid the letter will come. What will we do if we lose our checks? We will starve. Oh my God, it will not be worth living. Illegal immigrants fleeing poverty in Mexico began to face harsher treatment in the early 90s. Thousands of border guards were added. A Reuters dispatch from Mexico City, April 3, 1997, said about the tougher policy, any crackdown against illegal immigration automatically angers Mexicans, millions of whom migrate legally and illegally across the 2,000-mile border to the United States in search of jobs each year. 
Hundreds of thousands of Central Americans who had fled death squads in Guatemala and El Salvador, while the United States was giving military aid to those governments, now faced deportation because they had never been deemed political refugees. To admit that these cases were political would have given the lie to U.S. claims at the time that those repressive regimes were improving their human rights record and therefore deserved to continue receiving military aid. In early 1996, Congress and the President joined to pass an Anti-Terrorism and Effective Death Penalty Act, allowing deportation of any immigrant ever convicted of a crime, no matter how long ago or how serious. Lawful permanent residents who had married Americans and now had children were not exempt. The New York Times reported that July that hundreds of long-term legal residents have been arrested since the law passed. There was a certain irrationality to this new law, for it was passed in response to the blowing up of the federal building in Oklahoma City by Timothy McVeigh, who was native-born. The new government policy toward immigrants, far from fulfilling Clinton's promise of a new government for a new century, was a throwback to the notorious Alien and Sedition Laws of 1798 and the McCarthy-era McCarran-Walter Act of the 1950s. It was hardly in keeping with the grand claim inscribed on the Statue of Liberty. Give me your tired, your poor, your huddled masses yearning to breathe free, the wretched refuse of your teeming shore. Send these, the homeless, tempest-tossed to me. I lift my lamp beside the golden door. In the summer of 1996, apparently seeking the support of centrist voters for the coming election, Clinton signed a law to end the federal government's guarantee, created under the New Deal, of financial help to poor families with dependent children. This was called welfare reform, and the law itself had the deceptive title of Personal Responsibility and Work Opportunity Reconciliation Act of 1996. By this decision, Clinton alienated many of his former liberal supporters, Peter Edelman resigned from his post in the Department of Health, Education, and Welfare, bitterly criticizing what he considered Clinton's surrender to the right and the Republicans. Later, Edelman wrote, His goal was re-election at all costs. His political approach was not to calculate the risks, but to take no risks at all. His penchant for elevating shadow over substance has hurt poor children. The aim of welfare reform was to force poor families receiving federal cash benefits, many of them single mothers with children, to go to work by cutting off their benefits after two years, limiting lifetime benefits to five years, and allowing people without children to get food stamps for only three months in any three-year period. The Los Angeles Times reported, as legal immigrants lose access to Medicaid and families battle a new five-year limit on cash benefits, health experts anticipate resurgence of tuberculosis and sexually transmitted diseases. The aim of the welfare cuts was to save $50 billion over a five-year period, less than the cost of a planned new generation of fighter planes. Even the New York Times, a supporter of Clinton during the election, said that the provisions of the new law had nothing to do with creating work, but everything to do with balancing the budget by cutting programs for the poor. There was a simple but overwhelming problem with cutting off benefits to the poor to force them to find jobs. There were not jobs available for all those who would lose their benefits. In New York City in 1990, when 2,000 jobs were advertised in the sanitation department at $23,000 a year, 100,000 people applied. Two years later in Chicago, 7,000 people showed up for 550 jobs at Stouffer's, a restaurant chain. In Joliet, Illinois, 200 showed up at Commonwealth Edison at 4.30 a.m. to apply for jobs that did not yet exist. In early 1997, 4,000 people lined up for 700 jobs at the Roosevelt Hotel in Manhattan. It was estimated that at the existing rate of job growth in New York, with 470,000 adults on welfare, it would take 24 years to absorb those thrown off the rolls. What the Clinton administration steadfastly refused to do was to establish government programs to create jobs, as had been done in the New Deal era, when billions were spent to give employment to several million people, from construction workers and engineers to artists and writers. The era of big government is over, 
Clinton proclaimed as he ran for president in 1996, seeking votes on the supposition that Americans supported the Republican position that government was spending too much. Both parties were misreading public opinion, and the press was often complicit in this. When, in the mid-year election of 1994, only 37% of the electorate went to the polls, and slightly more than half voted Republican, the media reported this as a revolution. A headline in the New York Times read, Public shows trust in GOP Congress, suggesting that the American people were supporting the Republican agenda of less government. But in the story below that headline, a New York Times CBS News public opinion survey found that 65% of those polled said that it is the responsibility of government to take care of people who can't take care of themselves. Clinton and the Republicans, in joining against big government, were aiming only at social services. The other manifestations of big government, huge contracts to military contractors and generous subsidies to corporations, continued at exorbitant levels. Big government had, in fact, begun with the Founding Fathers, who deliberately set up a strong central government to protect the interests of the bondholders, the slave owners, the land speculators, the manufacturers. For the next 200 years, the American government continued to serve the interests of the wealthy and powerful, offering millions of acres of free land to the railroads, setting high tariffs to protect manufacturers, giving tax breaks to oil corporations, and using its armed forces to suppress strikes and rebellions. It was only in the 20th century, especially in the 30s and 60s, when the government, besieged by protests and fearful of the stability of the system, passed social legislation for the poor, that political leaders and business executives complained about big government. President Clinton reappointed Alan Greenspan as head of the Federal Reserve System, which regulated interest rates. Greenspan's chief concern was to avoid inflation, which bondholders did not want because it would reduce their profits. His financial constituency saw higher wages for workers as producing inflation, and worried that if there was not enough unemployment, wages might rise. Reduction of the annual deficit in order to achieve a balanced budget became an obsession of the Clinton administration. But since Clinton did not want to raise taxes on the wealthy or to cut funds for the military, the only alternative was to sacrifice the poor, the children, the aged, to spend less for health care, for food stamps, for education, for single mothers. Two examples of this appeared early in Clinton's second administration, in the spring of 1997. From the New York Times, May 8, 1997. A major element of President Clinton's education plan, a proposal to spend $5 billion to repair the nation's crumbling schools, was among the items quietly killed in last week's agreement to balance the federal budget. From the Boston Globe, May 22, 1997. After White House intervention, the Senate yesterday rejected a proposal to extend health insurance to the nation's 10.5 million uninsured children. Seven lawmakers switched their votes after senior White House officials called and said the amendment would imperil the delicate budget agreement. The concern about balancing the budget did not extend to military spending. Immediately after he was elected for the first time, Clinton had said, I want to reaffirm the essential continuity in American foreign policy. In Clinton's presidency, the government continued to spend at least $250 billion a year to maintain the military machine. He was accepting the Republican claim that the nation must be ready to fight two regional wars simultaneously, despite the collapse of the Soviet Union in 1989. At that time, Bush's Secretary of Defense, Dick Cheney, had said, The threats have become so remote, so remote that they are difficult to discern. General Colin Powell spoke similarly, reported in Defense News, April 8, 1991. I'm running out of demons. I'm running out of villains. I'm down to Castro and Kim Il-sung. Clinton had been accused during the election campaign of having evaded military service during the Vietnam War, apparently in opposition to the war, like so many other young Americans. Once in the White House, he seemed determined to erase the image of a draft dodger and took every opportunity to portray himself as a supporter of the military establishment. In the fall of 1993, 
Clinton Secretary of Defense, Les Aspen, announced the results of a bottom-up review of the military budget, envisioning the spending of over $1 trillion for the next five years. It called for virtually no reduction in major weapon systems. A conservative analyst with the Woodrow Wilson International Center, Anthony Cordesman, commented, There are no radical departures from the Bush base force or even from earlier U.S. strategy. After being in office two years and facing a Republican upsurge in the congressional elections of 1994, Clinton proposed even more money for the military than had been envisioned in the bottom-up review. A New York Times dispatch from Washington, December 1, 1994, reported, Trying to quiet Republican criticism that the military is underfinanced, President Clinton held a Rose Garden ceremony today to announce that he would seek a $25 billion increase in military spending over the next six years. The examples most often given by the Pentagon of two simultaneous major regional wars were Iraq and North Korea. Yet the 1991 war against Iraq had followed repeated U.S. arming of Iraq in the 80s, and it was reasonable to suppose that heavy military aid to South Korea and a permanent U.S. military force in that country had provoked increases in the North Korean arms budget, which was still much smaller than that of South Korea. Despite these facts, the United States under Clinton was continuing to supply arms to nations all over the world. Clinton, coming into office, approved the sale of F-15 combat planes to Saudi Arabia and F-16s to Taiwan. The Baltimore Sun reported, May 30, 1994, Next year, for the first time, the United States will produce more combat planes for foreign air forces than for the Pentagon, highlighting America's replacement of the Soviet Union as the world's main arms supplier. Encouraged by the Clinton administration, the defense industry last year had its best export year ever, having sold $32 billion worth of weapons overseas, more than twice the 1992 total of $15 billion. That pattern continued through the Clinton presidency. In the summer of 2000, the New York Times reported that in the previous year, the United States had sold over $11 billion of arms, one-third of all weapons sold worldwide. Two-thirds of all arms were sold to poor countries. In 1999, the Clinton administration lifted a ban on advanced weapons to Latin America. The Times called it, a victory for the big military contractors like the Lockheed Martin Corporation and the McDonnell Douglas Corporation. Clinton seemed anxious to show strength. He had been in office barely six months when he sent the Air Force to drop bombs on Baghdad, presumably in retaliation for an assassination plot against George Bush on the occasion of his visit to Kuwait. The evidence for such a plot was very weak, coming as it did from the notoriously corrupt Kuwaiti police. And Clinton did not wait for the results of the trial supposed to take place in Kuwait of those accused of the plot. And so, U.S. planes, claiming to have targeted intelligence headquarters in the Iraqi capital, bombed a suburban neighborhood, killing at least six people, including a prominent Iraqi artist and her husband. The Boston Globe reported, Since the raid, President Clinton and other officials have boasted of crippling Iraq's intelligence capacity and of sending a powerful message that Iraq leader Saddam Hussein had better behave. It turned out later that there was no significant damage, if any, to Iraqi intelligence facilities, and the New York Times commented, Mr. Clinton's sweeping statement was reminiscent of the assertions by President Bush and General Norman Schwarzkopf during the Persian Gulf War that later proved to be untrue. Democrats rallied behind the bombing, and the Boston Globe, referring to the use of Article 51 of the United Nations Charter as legal justification for the bombing, said this was diplomatically the proper rationale to invoke. Clinton's reference to the UN Charter conveyed the American desire to respect international law. In fact, Article 51 of the UN Charter permits unilateral military action only in defense against an armed attack and only when there is no opportunity to convene the Security Council. None of these factors were present in the Baghdad bombing. Columnist Molly Ivins suggested that the bombing of Baghdad for the purpose of sending a powerful message fit the definition of terrorism. The maddening thing about terrorists is that they are indiscriminate in their acts of vengeance or cries for attention or whatever. What is true for individuals must also be true of nations.
The bombing of Baghdad was a sign that Clinton, facing several foreign policy crises during his two terms in office, would react to them in traditional ways, usually involving military action, claiming humanitarian motives, and often with disastrous results for people abroad as well as for the United States. In Somalia, East Africa, in June 1993, with the country in a civil war and people desperate for food, the United States intervened late and badly. As journalist Scott Peterson wrote in Me Against My Brother at War in Somalia, Sudan and Rwanda, American and other foreign forces in Somalia committed startling acts of savagery hiding behind the banner of the United Nations. The Clinton administration made the mistake of intervening in an internal conflict between warlords. It decided to hunt down the most prominent of these, General Muhammad Aidid, in a military operation that ended with the killing of 19 Americans and perhaps 2,000 Somalis in October 1993. The attention of the American public was concentrated as usual on the deaths of Americans, glamorized in the film Black Hawk Down. The lives of Somali seemed much less important. As Peterson wrote, American and UN officers made clear that numbers of Somali dead did not interest them and they kept no count. In fact, the killing of the American Rangers by an angry Somali mob was preceded months before by a critical decision made by the United States to launch a military attack on a house in which tribal elders were meeting. It was a brutal operation. First, Cobra attack helicopters launched anti-tank missiles. Minutes later, Peterson reports, American ground troops stormed in and began finishing off the survivors, a charge U.S. commanders deny. But a survivor of the raid told Peterson, if they saw people shouting, they killed them. U.S. General Thomas Montgomery called the attack legitimate because they were all bad guys. Admiral Jonathan Howe, representing the U.N. operation, the United States had insisted an American must be in charge, defended the attack by saying the House was a very key terrorist planning cell and denied that civilians had died, though it was clear that the dead were tribal elders. The claim was that Tactical radios were found in the compound later, but Peterson wrote, I have never heard or seen any evidence that this attack even remotely met a single criteria of direct military advantage. Peterson commented, Though we all had eyes and had witnessed the crime, mission commanders defended the indefensible and stubbornly clung to the illusion that more war could somehow bring peace. They thought that Somalis would forget the carnage, forget the spilled blood of their fathers and brothers. The Somalis did not forget, and the killing of the American Rangers in October was one consequence. The catastrophic policy in Somalia led to another one the following year, in Rwanda, where famine and murderous tribal warfare were ignored. There was a UN force in Rwanda that might have saved tens of thousands of lives, but the United States insisted that it be cut back to a skeleton force. The result was genocide. At least a million Rwandans died. As Richard Heaps, a consultant to the Ford Foundation on Africa, wrote to the New York Times, the Clinton administration took the lead in opposing international action. When shortly after, the Clinton administration did intervene with military force in Bosnia, journalist Scott Peterson, who had by this time moved to the Balkans, commented on the difference in reactions to genocide in Africa and in Europe. He said that it was as if a decision had been made somewhere that Africa and Africans were not worth justice. Clinton's foreign policy had very much the traditional bipartisan emphasis on maintaining friendly relations with whatever governments were in power and promoting profitable trade arrangements with them, whatever their record in protecting human rights. Thus, aid to Indonesia continued despite that country's record of mass murder, perhaps 200,000 killed out of a population of 700,000 in the invasion and occupation of East Timor. Democrats and Republicans joined forces as the Senate defeated a proposal to prohibit the sale of lethal weapons to the Suharto regime of Indonesia. The Boston Globe wrote, July 11, 1994, The arguments presented by senators solicitous of Suharto's regime and of defense contractors, oil companies, and mining concerns doing business with Jakarta made Americans seem a people willing to overlook genocide for the sake of commerce. Secretary of State Warren Christopher made the all-too-familiar claim that Indonesia's respect for human rights is improving. 
This was the Clinton administration's rationale for pursuing business as usual with Suharto and his generals. In 1996, the Nobel Peace Prize was awarded to Jose Ramos Horta of East Timor. Speaking at a church in Brooklyn shortly before he won the prize, Ramos Horta said, In the summer of 1977, I was here in New York when I received a message telling me that one of my sisters, Maria, 21 years old, had been killed in an aircraft bombing. The aircraft, named Bronco, was supplied by the United States. Within months, a report about a brother, Guy, 17 years old, killed along with many other people in his village by Bell helicopters supplied by the United States. Same year, another brother, Nunu, captured and executed with an American-made M-16. Similarly, American-made Sikorsky helicopters were used by Turkey to destroy the villages of rebellious Kurds in what writer John Tierman, Spoils of War, The Human Cost of the Arms Trade, called a campaign of terror against the Kurdish people. By early 1997, the United States was selling more arms abroad than all other nations combined. Lawrence Korb, a Department of Defense official under Reagan, but later a critic of arms sales, wrote, It has become a money game, an absurd spiral in which we export arms only to have to develop more sophisticated ones to counter those spread out all over the world. Finally, in the last year of the Clinton administration, when mass resistance in East Timor brought about a referendum for independence, military aid stopped and the Suharto regime collapsed. At last, East Timor appeared to be winning its freedom. But military power continued to dominate policy, and the United States often stood alone in refusing to cut back on its weaponry. Though a hundred nations signed an agreement to abolish landmines, which were killing tens of thousands of people each year, the United States refused to go along. Though the Red Cross urged governments to suspend the use of cluster bombs, which spewed out thousands of tiny pellets, killing indiscriminately, the United States, which had used them in Vietnam and in the Gulf War, refused to desist. At a UN conference in Rome in 1999, the United States opposed the establishment of a permanent international war crimes court. There was fear that American officials and military leaders, who, like Henry Kissinger, had been responsible for policies leading to the deaths of large numbers of people, might be brought before such a court. Human rights clearly came second to business profit in U.S. foreign policy. When the international group Human Rights Watch issued its 1996 annual report, the New York Times, December 5, 1996, summarized its findings. The organization strongly criticized many powerful nations, particularly the United States, accusing them of failing to press governments in China, Indonesia, Mexico, Nigeria, and Saudi Arabia to improve human rights for fear of losing access to lucrative markets. This criticism was borne out by the Clinton administration's bizarre approach to two nations, China and Cuba, both of which considered themselves communist. China had massacred protesting students in Beijing in 1991 and put dissenters in prison. Yet, the United States continued to give China economic aid and certain trade privileges, most favored nation status, for the sake of U.S. business interests. Cuba had imprisoned critics of the regime, but had no bloody record of suppression as did communist China or other governments in the world that received U.S. aid. But the Clinton administration continued and even extended a blockade of Cuba that was depriving its population of food and medicine. In its relations with Russia, a concern for stability over morality seemed to motivate the Clinton administration. It insisted on firm support for the regime of Boris Yeltsin, even after Russia initiated a brutal invasion and bombardment of the outlying region of Chechnya, which wanted independence. Both Clinton and Yeltsin, on the occasion of the death of Richard Nixon, expressed admiration for the man who had continued the war in Vietnam, who had violated his oath of office, and who had escaped criminal charges only because he was pardoned by his own vice president. Yeltsin called Nixon, one of the greatest politicians in the world, and Clinton said that Nixon throughout his career remained a fierce advocate for freedom and democracy around the world. Clinton's foreign economic policy was in keeping with the nation's history, in which both major parties were more concerned for corporate interests than for the rights of working people, here or abroad, and saw foreign aid as a political and economic tool more than as a humanitarian act. In November 1993, 
An Associated Press dispatch reported the phasing out of economic aid to 35 countries. The administrator for the Agency for International Development, J. Brian Atwood, explained, We no longer need an AID program to purchase influence. A humanitarian organization, Bread for the World, said that most of the cuts would harm very poor countries and added with some bitterness that hunger, poverty, and environmental degradation were not priorities for the Clinton administration. The World Bank and the International Monetary Fund, both dominated by the United States, adopted a hard-nosed banker's approach to debt-ridden third world countries. They insisted that these poor nations allocate a good part of their meager resources to repaying their loans to the rich countries at the cost of cutting social services to their already desperate populations. The emphasis in foreign economic policy was on the market economy and privatization. This forced the people of former Soviet bloc countries to fend for themselves in a supposedly free economy without the social benefits that they had received under the admittedly inefficient and oppressive former regimes. Unregulated market capitalism turned out to be disastrous for people in the Soviet Union, who saw huge fortunes accumulated by a few and deprivation for the masses. The slogan of free trade became an important objective for the Clinton administration, and with the support of Republicans as well as Democrats, Congress enacted the North American Free Trade Agreement, NAFTA, with Mexico. This removed obstacles for corporate capital and goods to move freely back and forth across the Mexican-United States border. There was vigorous disagreement over the effects of NAFTA. Some economists claimed it would benefit the United States economy by opening up a larger Mexican market for United States goods. Opponents, including the major trade unions, said there would be a loss of jobs for American workers as corporations moved their operations across the border to hire Mexicans at low pay. Two economists for the Institute for Policy Studies examining NAFTA in early 1995, after a year of its operation, found that it had caused a net loss of 10,000 U.S. jobs. While more workers in Mexico were now hired by U.S. corporations that moved there, they were working at low wages with lax enforcement of workers' rights and environmental standards. The claim of the United States to support free trade was hardly to be believed since the government interfered with trade when this did not serve the national interest, which was a euphemism for corporate interest. Thus, it went to lengths to prevent tomato growers in Mexico from entering the U.S. market. In an even more flagrant violation of the principle of free trade, the United States would not allow shipments of food or medicine to Iraq or to Cuba. In 1996, on the television program 60 Minutes, U.S. Ambassador to the United Nations Madeleine Albright was asked about the report that a half million children have died as a result of sanctions against Iraq. That is more children than died in Hiroshima. Is the price worth it? Albright replied, I think this is a very hard choice, but the price, we think the price is worth it. The U.S. government did not seem to recognize that its punitive foreign policies, its military installations in countries all over the globe, might arouse anger in foreign countries, and that anger might turn to violence. When it did, the only response that the United States could think of was to react with more violence. Thus, when U.S. embassies in Kenya and Tanzania were bombed in 1998, the Clinton administration responded by bombing targets in Afghanistan and the Sudan. The claim was that the Afghanistan target was a base for terrorist activity, though there was no proof of this. As for the Sudan, the United States insisted it had bombed a plant manufacturing chemical weapons, but it turned out to be a factory that produced medicines for half the population of the country. The human consequences of that loss of medicine could not be calculated. In that same year, Clinton faced the greatest crisis of his presidency. The nation learned that a young government worker, Monica Lewinsky, had been making secret visits to the White House for sexual liaisons with the president. This became a sensational story, occupying the front pages of newspapers for months. An independent counsel was appointed to investigate, who took lurid, detailed testimony from Monica Lewinsky, who had been exposed by a friend who had taped their conversations, about sexual contact with Clinton. Clinton lied about his relationship with Lewinsky, and the House of Representatives voted to impeach him on the ground that he had lied in denying sexual relations with the young woman, and that he had obstructed justice by trying to conceal information about their relationship. 
This was only the second time in American history that a president had been impeached, and here too, as in the case of Andrew Johnson after the Civil War, the impeachment did not lead to the end of Clinton's presidency because the Senate did not vote for removal. What the incident showed was that a matter of personal behavior could crowd out of the public's attention far more serious matters, indeed matters of life and death. The House of Representatives would impeach the president on matters of sexual behavior, but it would not impeach him for endangering the lives of children by welfare reform or for violating international law in bombing other countries, Iran, Afghanistan, Sudan, or for allowing hundreds of thousands of children to die as a result of economic sanctions, Iraq. In 1999, Clinton's last year in office, a crisis erupted in the Balkans that once again showed the U.S. government as disposed to use force rather than diplomacy in solving matters of international concern. The problem that arose came out of the breakup ten years earlier of the Republic of Yugoslavia and the ensuing conflicts among the separated elements of a once united country. One of the parts of the former Yugoslavia was Bosnia-Herzegovina, with Croats massacring Serbs and Serbs massacring Croats and Muslims. After a vicious Serb attack on the city of Srebrenica, the United States bombed Serb positions and then negotiations in Oslo, Norway in 1995 stopped the fighting, dividing Bosnia-Herzegovina into Croat and Serbian entities. But the Oslo Accord had failed to deal with the problem of another part of the old Yugoslavia, the province of Kosovo, which, with a majority of its population Albanian and a minority being Serbian, was demanding independence from Serbia. The Serbian president, Slobodan Milosevic, had shown his ruthlessness earlier in Bosnia, and now, facing armed attack from Kosovo nationalists, attacked Kosovo, killing perhaps 2,000 people and causing several hundred thousand to become refugees. An international gathering in Rambouillet, France, was supposed to try to solve the problem diplomatically, but it presented terms to Yugoslavia that seemed certain to be rejected. NATO control of all of Kosovo and NATO military occupation of the rest of Yugoslavia. On March 23, 1999, the Serbian National Assembly responded with a counterproposal, rejecting NATO occupation and calling for negotiations leading toward the reaching of a political agreement on a wide-ranging autonomy for Kosovo. The Serbian proposal was ignored and was not reported in the major newspapers of the United States. The following day, NATO forces, meaning mostly U.S. forces, began the bombing of Yugoslavia. Presumably, the bombing was to stop the ethnic cleansing of Kosovo, that is, the forcing of Albanians out of the province by death or intimidation. But after two weeks of bombing, the New York Times reported, April 5, 1999, that more than 350,000 have left Kosovo since March 24. Two months later, with the bombing still going on, the figure had risen to over 800,000. The bombing of Yugoslavia, including the capital city of Belgrade, apparently intended to unseat Milosevic, led to an untold number of civilian casualties. An email message came to the United States from a professor at the University of Nice. The little town of Aleksinak, 20 miles away from my hometown, was hit last night with full force. The local hospital was hit, and a whole street was simply wiped out. What I know for certain is six dead civilians and more than 50 badly hurt. There was no military target around whatsoever. A New York Times reporter, Stephen Erlanger, described the mounded rubble across narrow Zmaj Jovina Street where Alexander Milic, 37, died on Tuesday. Mr. Milic's wife, Vezna, 35, also died. So did his mother and his two children, Miljana, 15, and Vladimir, 11 all of them killed about noon when an errant NATO bomb obliterated their new house and the cellar in which they were sheltering. When a peace agreement was finally signed on June 3, 1999, it was a compromise between the Rambouillet Accord, which Yugoslavia had rejected, and the Serbian National Assembly proposal, which had never been seriously considered. Noam Chomsky, in his book, The New Military Humanism, examined in detail the events of that spring and concluded, the outcome as of June 3rd suggests that diplomatic initiatives could have been pursued on March 23rd, averting a terrible human tragedy. But it seemed that the Clinton administration, like so many before it, Truman in Korea, Johnson in Vietnam, Bush in the Gulf War, chose military solutions when diplomatic ones were possible. The militarization of the nation, 
the huge military budgets, the maintenance of armed forces all over the world, the repeated use of weapons against other countries, meant that the resources available for human needs were not available. In one of his finer moments, President Dwight Eisenhower had said, Every gun that is made, every warship launched, every rocket fired, signifies, in a final sense, a theft from those who are hungry and are not fed, those who are cold and not clothed. Clinton's economic program, at first announced as a job creation program, was soon to change direction and concentrate on reduction of the deficit, which under Reagan and Bush had left a national debt of four trillion dollars. But this emphasis meant that there would be no bold program of expenditures for universal health care, education, child care, housing, the environment, the arts, or job creation. Clinton's small gestures would not come close to what was needed in a nation where one-fourth of the children lived in poverty, where homeless people lived on the streets in every major city, where women could not look for work for lack of child care, where the air, the water, were deteriorating dangerously. The United States was the richest country in the world, with 5% of the Earth's population, yet consuming 30% of what was produced worldwide. But only a tiny portion of the American population benefited. This richest 1% of the population saw its wealth increase enormously starting in the late 1970s. As a result of changes in the tax structure, by 1995, that richest 1% had gained over $1 trillion and now owned 40% of the nation's wealth. According to the business magazine Forbes, the 400 richest families owned $92 billion in 1982, but 13 years later this had jumped to $480 billion. In the 90s, the wealth of the 500 corporations of the Standard & Poor's Index had increased by 335%. The Dow Jones average of stock prices had gone up 400% between 1980 and 1995, while the average wage of workers had declined in purchasing power by 15%. It was therefore possible to say that the U.S. economy was healthy, but only if you considered the richest part of the population. Meanwhile, 40 million people were without health insurance, the number having risen by 33% in the 90s. And infants died of sickness and malnutrition at a rate higher than that of any other industrialized country. There seemed to be unlimited funds for the military, but people who performed vital human services in health and education had to struggle to barely survive. A 27-year-old woman named Kim Lee Jacobson, interviewed in the Boston Globe, epitomized the distorted national priorities. She had been named U.S. Toddler Teacher of 1999, but as she said, I'm hitting $20,000 this year after five years in the field. It all works out. I didn't come for a lot of money, so I don't expect to have a lot. According to the Bureau of Labor Statistics of the U.S. Census Bureau, in 1998, one of every three working people in the United States had jobs paying at or below the federal poverty level. The writer Barbara Ehrenreich spent a year working at various jobs, house cleaner, waitress, factory worker, and reported, in her book, Nickeled and Dimed, that jobs such as those left workers unable to afford housing or medical care or even adequate food. For people of color, the statistics were especially troubling. Black infants died at twice the rate of white children, and the life expectancy of a black man in Harlem, according to a United Nations report, was 46 years, less than that in Cambodia or the Sudan. This racial discrepancy was explained by some people as racial inferiority, as genetic deficiency. But what was clear was that growing up in a terrible environment, whatever one's natural abilities, became an insurmountable handicap for millions of Americans, whether white or black. A Carnegie Endowment study showed that two young people of equal standing on intelligence tests, even accepting the dubious worth of intelligence tests for children brought up under different circumstances, had very different futures depending on whom their parents were. The child of a lawyer, though rating no higher on mental tests than the child of a janitor, was four times as likely to go to college, twelve times as likely to finish college, and twenty-seven times as likely to end up in the top ten percent of American incomes. To change that situation, to bring about even a rough equality of opportunity, would require a drastic redistribution of wealth, a huge expenditure of money for job creation, health, education, and the environment. The United States, instead, was consigning its people to the mercy of the free market, forgetting or choosing to forget the disastrous consequence of such a policy in the 20s.
The market did not care about the environment or the arts, and it left many Americans without the basic means of subsistence, including adequate housing. Under Reagan, the government had reduced the number of housing units getting subsidies from 400,000 to 40,000. In the Clinton administration, the program ended altogether. Despite Clinton's 1997 inauguration day promise of a new government, his presidency offered no bold program to take care of these needs. For instance, although public opinion polls through the 80s and 90s indicated that the American people would support a program of free universal medical care supported by the General Treasury, Clinton was reluctant to advocate this. Instead, he put his wife Hillary in charge of a commission whose final report was over a thousand pages long, impossibly dense and complicated, and yet offering no answer to the problem: how to assure every American medical care free of the intervention of profiteering insurance companies. Aside from creating an even larger deficit, and there were economists who did not believe that reducing the deficit was necessary when crucial needs were not being met. There were two possible sources to pay for a bold program of social reconstruction, and the Clinton administration was not inclined to tap either one. One source was the military budget. Randall Forsberg, an expert on military expenditures, had suggested during the presidential campaign of 1992 that a military budget of 60 billion dollars to be achieved over a number of years would support a demilitarized US foreign policy appropriate to the needs and opportunities of the post-Cold War world. However, a military budget of 60 billion dollars to be achieved over a number of years would support a demilitarized US foreign policy appropriate to the needs and opportunities of the post-Cold War world. However, the military budget kept increasing even after the fall of the supposed target of the military buildup and by the end of Clinton's term was about 300 billion dollars a year a radical reduction of the military budget would require a renunciation of war a withdrawal of military bases from around the world and acceptance finally of the principle enunciated in the UN charter that the world should renounce the scourge of war it would speak to the fundamental human desire overwhelmed too often by barrages of super patriotic slogans to live at peace with others The public appeal for such a dramatic policy change would be based on a simple but powerful moral argument that given the nature of modern warfare the victims would be mostly civilians. To put it another way, war in our time is always a war against children. And if the children of other countries are to be granted an equal right to life with our own children, then we must use our extraordinary human ingenuity to find non-military solutions for world problems. The other possible source to pay for social reform was the wealth of the super rich. The richest 1% of the country had gained over 1 trillion dollars in the 80s and 90s as a result of tax breaks. A wealth tax, something not yet done as national policy but perfectly feasible, could retrieve that trillion dollars. For instance, at 100 billion dollars a year for 10 years and still leave that 1% very, very rich. In addition, a truly progressive income tax going back to the post-World War II levels of 70 to 90% on very high incomes could yield another 100 billion dollars a year. Clinton did raise taxes on the super rich by a few percentage points, changing the top rate from 31% to 37% and corporate taxes from 34% to 35%, but this was a pitifully small step in view of the need. With the 4 or 500 billion dollars gained each year by progressive taxation and demilitarization, there would be funds available to pay for a universal healthcare system funded by the government as Medicare is administered, as the healthcare system in Canada is handled, without the profit taking by insurance companies. Those funds could pay for a full employment program for the first time implementing the 1946 Full Employment Act. which committed the national government to creating useful employment opportunities for all people able and willing to work. One of Marge Piercy's poems ends with The pitcher cries for water to carry and a person for work that is real. Instead of giving out contracts for jet bombers and nuclear submarines, contracts could be offered to non-profit corporations to hire people to build homes, construct public transport systems, clean up the rivers and lakes, turn our cities into decent places to live. The alternative to such a bold program 
was to continue as before, allowing the cities to fester, forcing rural people to face debt and foreclosures, offering no useful work for the young, creating a marginal population of idle, desperate people, many of them young, many of them people of color, who turned to drugs and crime, constituting a threat to the physical security of the rest of the population. The response of the government to such signs of desperation, anger, and alienation has been historically quite predictable. Build more jails, lock up more people, execute more prisoners, and continue with the same policies that produce the desperation. And so, by the end of the Clinton administration, the United States had more of its population in prison per capita, a total of two million people, than any other country in the world, with the possible exception of China. Clinton claimed to be moderating his policies to match public opinion, but opinion surveys in the 80s and early 90s indicated that Americans favored bold policies that neither Democrats nor Republicans were willing to put forward. Universal free health care, guaranteed employment, government help for the poor and homeless, with taxes on the rich and cuts in the military budget to pay for social programs. The gap between national policy and the feelings of the American public suggested that another scenario was possible, one that envisioned in the new millennium citizens organizing to demand what the Declaration of Independence promised, a government that protected the equal right of everyone to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. This meant economic arrangements that distributed the national wealth rationally and humanely. This meant a culture where the young no longer were taught to strive for success as a mask for greed. Throughout the 90s, while conservative Republicans and moderate Democrats were running the government, there were large numbers of American citizens, unrepresented in Washington, unreported in the press, who were protesting government policy in various ways and demanding a more just and peaceful society. The signs of citizen energy outside the circles of power in Washington were not given much attention in the national media, except when a phenomenon was too big to ignore. Even a gathering of a half million adults and children of all colors arriving in the nation's capital to stand for children was paid little or no attention by television and newspapers. The signs of defiance and resistance were many and varied. In Minneapolis, there was a continuing campaign against a corporation that manufactured landmines. An ex-GI who had been mutilated by an American landmine came to Minneapolis to join the campaign, joined by a young woman who was traveling all over the world to tell people of the children dying on all continents as a result of millions of landmines planted by the United States and other nations. Four nuns, the McDonald sisters, who were indeed sisters, participated in the protest and were arrested. In 1994 in Los Angeles, in opposition to a new California law that took away basic health and educational rights from the children of illegal immigrants, a quarter of a million people took to the streets in protest. When the United States made clear its intention to drop bombs on Iraq, presumably because Iraq was not allowing inspection of what American officials called weapons of mass destruction, Secretary of State Madeleine Albright and other officials spoke to a town meeting in Columbus, Ohio to build up public support for the bombing. But the planned scenario was interrupted by a young man who, despite plans to control all questions, managed to get the floor and ask Madeleine Albright about all the other nations, allies of the United States, that possessed weapons of mass destruction. The Secretary of State was obviously taken by surprise and stumbled through an answer, which a national TV audience could plainly see. Plans for the bombing were quickly postponed, though some time later, the regular bombing of Iraq, of which the press took no notice, resumed. When Madeleine Albright was given an honorary degree by the University of California at Berkeley in the year 2000, there were protests in the audience and a huge banner, Madeleine Albright is a war criminal. Protesters and the banner were removed from the theater. It happened that the student selected to receive the university's prestigious university medal and to give the student address at commencement was a young Palestinian woman named Fadia Rafidi. She was moved to the end of the program so that Albright could speak and leave, but she was determined to speak to Albright's defense of the U.S. sanctions against Iraq. She spoke of the medical supplies not allowed into Iraq, about the hundreds of thousands of deaths of children as a result of the sanctions. She agreed that Saddam Hussein was a brutal dictator, but, she said, when he was gassing the Kurds, he was gassing them using chemical weapons that were manufactured in Rochester, New York. And when he was fighting a long and protracted war with Iran, where one million people died, it was the CIA that was funding him, 
It was U.S. policy that built this dictator. When they didn't need him, they started imposing sanctions on his people. Sanctions should be directed at people's governments, not at the people. In 1998, 7,000 people from all over the country traveled to Fort Benning, Georgia, to protest the existence of the School of the Americas, whose graduates, trained by the United States, had participated in atrocities in various Latin American countries. They carried eight caskets, representing the six priests, a cook, and a young girl who had been assassinated by military men invading their home. Ironically, the Georgia federal judge who sentenced them to prison terms, Robert J. Elliott, was the same judge who had pardoned Lieutenant William Calley, found guilty of the My Lai massacre of villagers in Vietnam. On the anniversary of the bombing of Nagasaki in August 1999, eight pacifists decided to block four lanes of traffic leading to a nuclear submarine base in Bangor, Maine. At that base, eight Trident submarines were housed, carrying over a thousand nuclear warheads. The protesters were arrested. They managed to explain to the jury, however, the reason for their opposition to nuclear weapons, and they were acquitted. The woman who headed the jury said later, I am proud to sit with these people. The culture had been affected by the movements of the 60s in a way that could not be obliterated. There was an unmistakable stubborn new consciousness manifested from time to time in the cinema, on television, in the world of music, an awareness that women deserved equal rights, that the sexual preferences of men and women were their own affair, that the growing gap between rich and poor gave the lie to the word democracy. Racism was still deeply embedded in American society. The evidence was in continued police brutality against people of color, in the higher rates of infant mortality in the black population, the lack of jobs for young blacks and the corresponding growth of crime and imprisonment. But the country was becoming more diverse, more Latino people, more Asians, more interracial marriages. It was projected that by the year 2050, people of color would be equal in number to whites in the United States. There were sporadic attempts to organize the discontent among the nation's African Americans. In the late 80s, there had been a hint of a future possibility, as the black leader Jesse Jackson, speaking for the poor and dispossessed of all colors, a rainbow coalition, won millions of votes in the presidential primary and gave the nation a brief, rare surge of political excitement. In 1995, a million men traveled from all over the country to Washington, D.C. The Million Man March to declare to the nation's leaders that they intended to become a force for change. The march did not have a clear agenda, but it was an expression of solidarity. In the summer of 1998, 2,000 African-American men met in Chicago to found the Black Radical Congress. The following year, the West Coast Longshoremen's Union carried out an eight-hour work stoppage in protest against the incarceration and death sentence of Mumaya Abu Jamal. Jamal was a respected black journalist who had been tried and sentenced under circumstances that suggested his race and his radicalism, as well as his persistent criticism of the Philadelphia police, were the reasons he now sat on death row. The labor movement in the 90s was showing signs of a new energy. This despite the gradual decline in union membership as manufacturing plants moved out of the country and industrial workers were being outnumbered by service and white collar workers who were more difficult to organize. There was impetus for a new militancy as it became clear that the wealth of the nation was going mostly to the very rich and the gap between rich and poor was growing. In the 90s, the income of the richest 5% of the population grew by 20% while the income of the poor and middle class, taking into consideration the rise in cost of living, either fell or remained the same. In 1990, the average pay of the chief executive officers of the 500 largest corporations was 84 times that of the average worker. By 1999, it was 475 times the average worker's pay. A new president of the AFL-CIO, John Sweeney, coming out of the Service Employees International Union, a sign of the change in the labor force, appeared to depart sharply from the conservatism of his predecessors. He encouraged the idea of a Union Summer, inspired by the Freedom Summer in Mississippi in 1964, tapping the idealism of young people by inviting them to help in the organizing of the new service workers, white-collar workers, farm workers, immigrant workers. The unions were losing some strikes, as in the long, bitter struggles in the 90s in Decatur, Illinois, against three corporate giants, Caterpillar, Firestone, and Staley. But there were also victories. United Parcel Service workers went on strike for 15 days, 
a strike that brought great national attention and won their demand that part-time jobs without health and other benefits be converted to 10,000 full-time jobs with benefits. The machinists' union won strikes at the Boeing Company and McDonnell Douglas. Hotel workers won strikes in Minneapolis and San Francisco. Cleaning women, mostly immigrants, were victorious in Los Angeles, striking against owners of skyscrapers where the poorly paid workers cleaned the offices of the city's most prosperous business people. In the year 2000, the biggest white-collar strike in the nation's history was won for 19,000 engineers and professional workers of Boeing, who succeeded in having their salaries match those of workers in other Boeing plants. One of the greatest union victories in decades took place in Los Angeles County in 1999, where, after an 11-year campaign, the Service Employees International Union won the right to represent 74,000 home health care workers. That same year, the newly merged unions of garment workers and textile workers called UNITE, Union of Needle Trades, Industrial and Textile Employees, workers, which had been trying for 25 years to organize Cannon Mills in North Carolina, won their union election at two mills in Kannapolis. Women were taking a leading role in the new leadership of the AFL-CIO. Karen Nussbaum, who had been president of the 9 to 5 National Association of Working Women, became director of the Working Women's Department of the AFL-CIO. And by 1998, 10 of the 21 departments of the union were headed by women. An alliance between students and the labor movement was being forged by the campaign for a living wage for campus workers, which soon spread to 150 college campuses. For instance, at Harvard University, students organized to demand that the Harvard administration, sitting on a treasury of $20 billion, pay their janitors and other service employees a wage sufficient to support their families. Many of these workers had to work two jobs, as much as 80 hours a week, to pay for rent and food and medical care. The Harvard students staged colorful rallies in which janitors and other campus workers spoke about their needs. Members of the Cambridge City Council and trade union leaders, including John Sweeney and other high officers of the AFL-CIO, took the microphone to declare their support. The arrival of two young movie stars, Matt Damon and Ben Affleck, to support the campaign attracted a huge crowd. Both had lived and gone to school in Cambridge. Matt Damon had spent a few years at Harvard before dropping out to go to Hollywood. Ben Affleck spoke movingly about his father, working poorly paid at a menial job at Harvard. When the Harvard administration continued to refuse to negotiate, 40 students took over one of the Harvard administration buildings and remained there day and night for several weeks, supported by hundreds of people outside with tents spread out on the campus grass. Support for the sit-in came from all over the country, and finally Harvard agreed to negotiate. The upshot was a victory for the campus workers, with Harvard agreeing to raise the pay of janitors to $14 an hour, and to give health benefits, and to insist that outside contractors match those conditions. In the spring of 2000, students at Wesleyan University in Connecticut occupied the admissions office, insisting that the university president guarantee a living wage, health and retirement benefits, and job security to janitors and other service workers. After several days of the sit-in, the university agreed to comply with the demands. Students around the country organized a workers' rights consortium. At Yale University, the University of Arizona, Syracuse University, the University of Kentucky, and on many other campuses, students carried on campaigns to support the demands of working people. The living wage campaign took a powerful hold on popular sympathies at a time when the rich were becoming richer. In Duluth, Minnesota, 56 organizations joined forces to demand that the city give contracts only to businesses that gave a living wage. This meant several dollars above the official minimum wage to employees. The five-year limit on federal aid to families with dependent children, set in the 1996 welfare reform legislation, meant that millions of people would face deprivation when their benefits expired. Activists began organizing seriously in the year 2000 for that eventuality, bringing people from all over the country into a campaign to end poverty. A veteran of the welfare rights movement in Boston, Diane Dujan, declared, In the richest country in the year 2000, no one should be living hungry, homeless, and under stress of not knowing how to feed their children and still pay the rent. The Poor People's Economic Human Rights Campaign in 1998 organized a bus tour of 35 cities to pull together the stories of people who could not feed their families, whose electricity had been cut off, 
who had been evicted from their homes because they could not afford to pay their bills. The following year, some of the PPEHRC traveled to Geneva, Switzerland to testify before the UN Commission on Human Rights. They pointed to the UN Universal Declaration of Human Rights, which Eleanor Roosevelt had helped to draw up, and which declared that decent wages, food, housing, health care, and education was a right of all people. Religious leaders who had been quiet since their involvement in the movements for civil rights and against the Vietnam War began to speak out on economic inequality. In the summer of 1996, the New York Times reported, More than at any other time in decades, religious leaders are making common cause with trade unions, lending their moral authority to denounce sweatshops, back a higher minimum wage, and help organize janitors and poultry workers. The clergy has not lined up with labor to such an extent since the heyday of Cesar Chavez, the charismatic farm workers leader in the 70s, and perhaps the Depression. All of these groups, and the people they represented, the homeless, the struggling mothers, the families unable to pay their bills, the 40 million without health insurance, and the many more with inadequate insurance, were facing an enormous barrier of silence in the national culture. Their lives, their plight, was not being reported in the major media. And so the myth of a prosperous America, proclaimed by powerful people in Washington and Wall Street, persisted. There were valiant attempts to break through the control of information, especially after the Telecommunications Act of 1996, which enabled the handful of corporations dominating the airwaves to expand their power further. Mergers enabled tighter control of information. Two gigantic media corporations, CBS and Viacom, joined in a $37 billion deal. The Latin American writer Eduardo Galeano commented, Never have so many been held incommunicado by so few. Alternative media made desperate attempts to break through this control. There were several hundred community radio stations around the country. The Pacifica Network was the most successful of these, bringing alternative information and ideas to their listeners. A one-man operation by David Barsamian, Alternative Radio, distributed dissident views, interviews, and lectures via satellite to radio stations around the country. Community newspapers in towns and cities around the country, though their circulation was small, tried to tell the stories of ordinary people. In Boston, homeless people joined to publish the newspaper Spare Change to tell their stories, print their poems, and then to sell the newspaper on the streets of Boston and Cambridge as a way of making some money. They declared their aims to be a voice for the voiceless and to be an organizing tool for the homeless community. By the turn of the century, they had been turning out the newspaper for eight years. This idea spread to other parts of the country, and soon there were street newspapers in 40 different cities, which formed the North American Street Newspaper Association. The National Coalition for the Homeless, set up in the nation's capital, distributed a monthly newsletter. Perhaps the most dramatic attempt to bring to the American people and to the world the facts of corporate domination over the lives of ordinary people was the great gathering of demonstrators in Seattle, Washington, in the last months of 1999. Seattle had been chosen as the meeting place of the World Trade Organization, and representatives of the most wealthy and powerful institutions on the globe were there to make plans to maintain their wealth and power, to bring the principles of capitalism to work across national boundaries all over the earth. Tens of thousands of people converged on Seattle to protest the plans of the World Trade Organization to expand free trade agreements. This, the protesters argued, meant the freedom of corporations to roam the globe in search of cheap labor and no restrictions on industrial policies that poisoned the environment. The issues around free trade were complex, but a simple idea seemed to unite those who showed up in Seattle to oppose the WTO. That the health and freedom of ordinary people all over the world should not be sacrificed on behalf of corporate profit. More than a thousand organizations from 90 countries, representing labor unions, environmental groups, consumers, religious groups, farmers, indigenous people, women's groups, and more, had signed a statement asking governments to stop the expansion of the World Trade Organization. In Seattle, there was a remarkable set of alliances. Steelworkers rallied with environmentalists, and machinists joined animal rights activists. Farmers joined a huge labor march of 40,000 on November 30th and then union people attended a family farm rally a few days later. The press gave disproportionate attention to a small number of demonstrators who broke windows and created a ruckus. But the overwhelming majority in Seattle were nonviolent, and it was these that the police chose to attack with tear gas and then arrest. 
Hundreds were jailed, but the demonstrations continued. News of the events in Seattle went to the nation and all over the world. The official WTO meeting was clearly disturbed by the crowds of protesters, and there were signs of division between the industrial countries and third world countries. As John Nichols reported in The Progressive, while the official WTO sessions were characterized by deep divides between delegations from the northern and southern hemispheres, there was an unprecedented level of north-south unity on the streets. Farmers from around the world came together. The huge AFL-CIO rally cheered speakers from close to a dozen countries. And after events organized to highlight the devastating impact that globalization was having on women in the third world, throngs of women from Africa, Latin America, India, Europe, and the United States marched together in human chains through the streets of downtown Seattle. The summit meeting of the World Trade Organization was shaken by all this, and at a certain point, the talks collapsed. It was a remarkable illustration of the ability of organized citizens to challenge the most powerful corporations in the world. Mike Brannan, writing in the newspaper of the insurgent Teamsters, caught the mood of exultation. The kind of solidarity that all of us dream of was in the air as people sang, chanted, played music, and stood up to the cops and the WTO. The people owned the streets that day, and it was as much a lesson for us as it was for corporate America. The Seattle demonstrations coincided with a growing movement throughout the nation, on college campuses and in communities against sweatshop conditions endured by third world men, women, even children, working for American corporations. The New York Times reported a month after Seattle, pressure from college students and other opponents of sweatshops has led some factories to make goods for industry giants like Nike and The Gap to cut back on child labor, to use less dangerous chemicals, and to require fewer employees to work 80-hour weeks, according to groups that monitor such factories. As last month's protests in Seattle conditions in such factories were a major focus, with many demonstrators demanding that trade treaties punish countries that permit violations of minimum labor standards, many corporate executives acknowledge that the anti-sweatshop movement's efforts are paying off. Seattle was the first of a series of international gatherings of trade union people, students, environmentalists, in opposition to the increasing control of the world economy by giant corporations. In the year following the Seattle demonstrations, protesters showed up wherever a summit of wealthy entrepreneurs was taking place. Washington, D.C., Philadelphia, Davos, Switzerland, Los Angeles, and Prague. Officials of the World Bank and the International Monetary Fund could not ignore such a protest movement. They began to declare their concern for the environment and the conditions of their workers. Whether this would result in real changes was unclear. But undoubtedly, the corporate leaders of the world could no longer ignore their critics. With the various strands of protest and resistance in politics, in the workplace, in the culture, come together in the next century, the next millennium, to fulfill the promise of the Declaration of Independence, of equal rights to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, no one could predict. All one could do was to act on the possibility, knowing that inaction would make any prediction a gloomy one. If democracy were to be given any meaning, if it were to go beyond the limits of capitalism and nationalism, this would not come, if history were any guide, from the top. It would come through citizens' movements, educating, organizing, agitating, striking, boycotting, demonstrating, threatening those in power with disruption of the stability they needed.